السماء قبا للعبد إذا اغتنما رمضان تجلى وتسمى قبا للعبد إذا اغتنما فالخير وفير إن صرما وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيم حبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسد مصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سفن النجاة الأعلام ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلنها هلك وغرق ثم أما بعد respect to sisters brothers السلام عليكم جميعا رحمة الله وبركاته Today we are also continuing from where we left from. Yesterday we spoke about the rights of the tongue. Today Imam Zain al-Abidin moves on to speak to us about the right of hearing. Because sometimes also we are unaware of what we allow ourselves to hear. And that times causes us to deviate or stray from the right path. And I'll show you what the Imam says and I'll explain insha'Allah. The Imam says, وَأَحَقُّ السَّمْعَ فَتَنْزِيهَهُ عَنْ عَنْ تَجْعَلَهُ طَلْ إِلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ إِلَّا لِفُوَّهَةٍ كَرِيمًا تُحْدِثُ فِي قَلْبِكَ خَيْرًا وَتُكْسِبُ بِهِ خُلُقًا كَرِيمًا فَإِنَّهُ بَابُ الْكَلَامِ إِلَىٰ الْقَلْبِ أَدِّي إِلَيْهِ ضُرُوبُ الْمَعَانِ عَلَىٰ مَا فِيهَا مِنْ خَيْرٍ أَوْ شَرٍ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ He says, the right of your hearing to honor it from being the path to your mind. Allahu Akbar, look at these words. Because it's your hearing that reaches your mind. So you must be very attentive to what reach your mind. Because if something open, if something untrue, something false reaches that mind, then it will have an effect on how you think and how you relate this. So he says, the right of your hearing is to honor it from being the path into your mind, unless for a noble practice that creates a virtue in your heart. So Allah, yani you should only allow yourself to something that will create something good in your heart. When I hear someone saying, I want to sin like Lady Pink, huh? she comes stage and say, I want to sin. Huh? Meaning, I don't want to be a good person. I want to do everything haram. And you're listening to this day and night, day and day and night, day and can it happen to your heart? Your heart is going to be the vessel that holds within it something not right. Okay. When Ghiba, Namima, he back, uh, backbiting, gossip, slander. What will happen to the heart? It the thing is the path to the mind. What rests in the mind affects the heart. Right? In Ramadan, I think I shared this story with you. Two women were gossiping about some other woman. Rasulullah sent Bilal to them. He said, ask them to break their rosa. Ah, Ya Rasulullah, how could we break our rosa? We are fasting for the sake of Allah. So they refused. So the Prophet called for them to come. When they called, when they came over, the Prophet had prepared for them buckets. You know what a bucket? He said, break your rosa and vomit in this pocket. So they did. They vomited pieces of meat. Pieces, pieces of meat in the bucket. So Allah said to them, do you know why I told you to be your rosa? What is the benefit of a rosa when you sit and backbite about people? So much so that the effect of that biting is so physical, a vomiting blood and the flesh of the ones you're beating since the morning. Since the, so why do you want to allow your hearing to listen to something that is not right, that is not healthy? And Rasulullah and the scholars of Islam say, you have two options when Ghiba and Namima is being done. 
Only two options. Option number one is to stop them from continuing. Option number two is to leave the place you are in. Option number three, you are party to the Ghiba and Namima even if you don't say a word. Huh? So, cannot say I did not take part in the gossip. By virtue of listening to it, Rasulullah and Imam Ali, Salamullah Ali, both of them have a hadith. They say the one who listens to Ghiba but does not participate in it is a party to Ghiba itself. So why? Why stay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hujurat, أَيُحُبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother alive while gossiping and slandering him? Surely it is an abhorrent act to eat the flesh of your brother alive. Imagine someone comes and says, I want to bite your hand. Huh? I want to bite your thighs, I want to bite your shoulder. Alive and chew that meat of your living brother. He says, impossible. Something that the human, you know, mind cannot comprehend or accept. So the, the Imam says, don't allow your hearing to receive anything except that which will create a virtue inside your heart. Listen to the Quran, listen to a good speech, listen to music. But if it's good music, huh? not bad music like Ayatollah Khamenei, huh? Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran, he's according to his taqli, he himself he says, before I became a marja, <laughs> because now he wants to be extra careful, of course. Before I became a marja, I used to listen to Beethoven, you know, slow music. So because it's not haram to listen. Maybe some ayatollahs say it's haram, something else. But I'm saying that some ayatollahs allow it. And he says, if you listen to something that is healthy, yeah? for example, in the West, they've come up with a type of music which is totally based on nature. <coughs> sound of whales, sound of birds, and they mix in the background a little bit of soft music. They say it is one of the most relaxing things to listen to. And Subhanallah, if you do listen to it, you find that you are emptying all your stress away when you listen to it. Because why? It's Allah's natural sounds. The sound of whales, the sound of birds, the sound of, you know, and things like that. So, when you want to listen to something, listen to something healthy. Train your hearing to always listen to something that is healthy. Then the Imam says what? Oh, by which you may gain a decent manner. Yani, if you listen to something good, you may practice that good. By practicing that good, you what? You will gain a new dimension to your mannerism. You will become more decent of a human being. More decent of a human being. By virtue of training your listening to listen to something good, what happens to you? You find gradually that you only talk about something good. You don't find it in yourself to speak about something foul. Right? It becomes a natural reaction that everything that flows from your mouth after that is something that is decent. Even if you try to swear, you can't. Because it cannot come part and parcel of your setup anymore. Because you don't hear anything but good. So if someone does not hear anything but good, where is he going to be able to use foul language from? Right? But if every day I'm hearing foul language, and every day I'm training my hearing by repeating the foul language as well, then where will I find good language? Huh? And some, sometimes we, th we, we complain that our children have very bad mannerism. But where is that bad mannerism coming from? It's coming from the way the mother speaks to the dad and the dad speaks to the mother, right? The abuse that is happening between mom and dad is from the outset when the child is growing up, all he hears is fighting. 
Mom is shouting at dad, dad is shouting at mom. Mom is saying, curse the day I know you. The father is saying, I hate your guts and, and your mother and your father and everything that comes from your family, right? If the child grows up in that environment, what the child is going to become? An imam of a mosque? He's not going to become an imam of a mosque. Of course, he will repeat the same language and terminology as what the uh, uh, parents will do. If the parents tell lies, the child will grow up to tell lies. If the parents tell the truth, then the child by nature will grow to tell the truth. So the Imam says, oh, by training yourself to listen to what is good, you will gain a decent manner. The hearing, then the Imam says, is the gate into the mind and to which it delivers various types of either noble or evil meanings. Huh? The first thing that registers in the mind is what you hear and what you see. Allah will get to the rights of seeing as well. So the Imam emphasizes that to, for example, people say, how can we change ourselves and become good mu'min? You cannot separate your parts from one another. You must train your hands, your sight, your hearing, your tongue, your bodily parts, your mind, your soul, you become a good mu'min. But Wallah Shaykh, can you give us a dua? So we can, like a magic wand, you know the Asa of Musa? فَضَرَبَ بِهَا الْبَحَرِ So he hit the sea with it, it split into part. Sometimes, you know what we want? We want something like that. A dua splits our head, change the chip of good, bad, put a new chip that is good, then close it. It's not going to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you cannot claim to be a mu'min or someone righteous until you struggle in our path. أَحَسِبَ النَّاسِ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُوا Do people think that it is simply they're going to be led to claim and say by lip service that we are mu'mans and they will not be put to the test? They have to be put to the test. So when you are facing a situation where people are speaking about foul things, stop them. But stop them nicely. Huh? Change the direction of the speech. Change the direction of the setup. Huh? Don't allow yourself to be in a setup or make our setup something that revolves around gossip. Because 90% of our chilling out and chillaxing, right? is what we say to one another if we don't talk about someone else there is no value to the whole session it's not nice it's so dry amazing that imagine if the one that is being talked about is you will you love to be in that session and trust me and this is a guarantee from me to you Everyone that sits in the same gathering and talk about someone else, the minute you leave, the whole conversation will be about you. And if this person leaves, it will transfer to him again. The next one that leaves, the talk will be about him. And it's a vicious circle until everyone talks about everyone. A true friend is the one who's true to you in your absence and in your presence. Right? Not the one when you turn your back, he begins to smack at you or begins to attack you. No, that's not a friend. Huh? And that's why the Imam says that it is the gateway to every noble or evil things. And there is no might except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you want to exercise the ability to shun yourself from listening to something that is bad, make sure that you always listen, uh, 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 you always take the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into account. Then the Imam moves on to speak about the right of the sight. The, the right of the sight. He says what? وَأَمَّا حَقُّ الْبَصَرِ فَغَضُّهُ عَمَّا لَا يَحُلُّ لَكَ وَتَرْكُ ابْتِذَالِهِ إِلَّا لِمَوْضِعِ عِبْرَةٍ تَسْتَقْبِلُ بِهَا بَصَرًا أَوْ تَسْتَفِيدُ بِهَا عِلْمًا فَإِنَّ الْبَصَرَ بَابُ الْإِعْتِبَارِ The Imam says, the right of your sight is to lower it from what you have no right to look at. Huh? Uh, 
So then the young man, Sheikh, can I go to the beach? Yes, you can go to the beach. But what happens if someone is in a bikini? Should I look? I didn't ask her to wear a bikini. But she didn't ask you to come to the beach either. Right? Then if you want to go to the beach, go to a beach where there is nothing haram to look at. Or if there is haram, avoid to look at it. Because we don't want you also not to enjoy life. You can enjoy life. Islam says you can enjoy life. And this goes for both genders, not only for for men or or women. No, for both genders. Men should not look at women. Women should not look at men unless there are their husbands. Huh? Unless there are their mahrams. Right? If you look around the world, why do you think there is so much promiscuity around people in the world? Why? Because, because people are never content with their partners. Secondly, because they're always gazing and eyeing someone else. But if every woman became Prajet Pardo for her husband, and every man was Tom Cruise for his wife, then no one will look outside. Right? But if men don't groom themselves, someone comes home with a beard that big. Where do I find your mouth? Where do I find it? I have to go through. Where do I find it? Huh? If I want to be sitting next to you to give, to, for you to give me a hug, you smell like grease, or like garlic, or like onion, or like dirt from the street. How? Is it I'm gonna feel inclined towards you? Uh, what will draw me towards you? Right? Flip the coin. When the husband comes home and the wife is still with the kitchen clothes, uh, who cooking all day and the smell of her dress is bakora or bachipako, or I don't know what, or all this, uh, you know, tenduri chicken. How is the? How is this going to appeal to the husband? Right? That's why you find our girls are so infatuated with what? Titanic, Twilight, uh, Days of Our Life. Uh, why? Because they give you something which is not realistic. It's fantasy. They show you the wife is always immaculate. Right? She can be immaculate. Right? But this is not realistic. But we must try our level best. Imam Ali said, the struggle of a woman at home is to beautify herself to her husband. To do everything under the sun. Huh? To go and shop every week at La Senza. Well, sorry to say that. Alright? Unayomi. Okay? But if this is not going to take place, then our husbands will look outside. This is a fact. This is a fact. There is no denial about it. If you think that you can keep your husband at home on the basis of being dressed in the same dress all day, then you've got something else coming. And it's not going to happen at all, no matter what. Right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to travel, and he used to come back home from his travel, he would never go home at night to his home. He would spend the night in the mosque. He was asked, why ya Rasulullah? He said, because when I'm traveling, I'm tired. It shows on my face. I don't want my wife to look at me and think I have changed towards her. So I would spend the night in the mosque, relax, take a shower in the morning, put my new clothes on, and then I will go to her because she is always familiar to see me in that way. Look at the way the Prophet dealt with his wives. Salawat Allah salam And not only that, the Prophet sallallahu used to keep a comb. You know a comb? Under his pillow. Every day he would wake up. Before anyone would see him, he would comb his hair and his beard. And when he see that the hair on his beard is not even, he used to trim the beard which is not even. 
Subhanallah. He used to trim the bead that is not even. In fact, once one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ came and he had a very, very messy bead. He said to him, when Allah gave you that hair, He gave you that hair to look after it and to trim it because you're not a goat. You're a human being. And your wife has a right on you that when she wants to see you, she wants to see you groomed. She doesn't want to see you in a way that she cannot relate to you as a human being. Right? So you must always be in a position to groom yourself because what you see has a lasting impression in your brain. You know, when you come to pray in Salah, why do you often get flashbacks? Because the brain registers what it sees. Right? So every time you see something haram, when is it going to haunt you? At the time when you are trying to be at peace with Allah, it flashes, comes out to distract you from what? From connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So they say that the looking at something haram is like an arrow that goes straight to your heart. So much so that every time you look at haram, the Prophet explains, your heart will get a black dot on it. Every time you look at something haram, you get a black dot. So the Prophet explains, then after a while, the heart becomes so black because of looking at haram. Because of looking, so you can't find the light of Allah coming into your heart. And then what do you say? Quran doesn't move me anymore. I don't, f- I don't feel being moved when I hear the dua be- being played, when I am in prayer. Why? Because our hearts are black from looking at haram. How is it going to see the light of Allah or be moved when the Quran is being recited or the dua is being recited or even any good is being recited? Even if someone speaks to you a word of good, you will not recognize it anymore. Why? Because your heart is so black. And the Prophet ﷺ says, the best way to rid yourself of a hard heart is to keep away from haram. Don't look at haram. Then your heart becomes so soft when you don't look at something haram. So the Imam says, the right of your sight is to lower it from what you have no right to and stop misusing it unless for a lesson by which you may gain sagacity or benefit some knowledge. Yani, if you look at something where it will make your Iman grow, for example, you contemplate on the horizon, at night you sit and you look at the stars, you look at the moon, you say, Subhanaka ma khalaqta hadha batila, alladheena, الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطنا فقنا عذاب النار The ones who remember Allah while standing, while sitting, while on their side and they contemplate on the universe and they say surely O oh Allah you did not create this in vain you did not create this for game so protect us from hellfire and do not allow us to enter the abode of your hellfire. By looking at these things, that's why then we can learn and appreciate the statement of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib when he said, every time I look at something, I see Allah with it, above it, and Huh? and inside with it above it and inside it okay then can I look at a good man good looking man or a good looking woman you can without riba what is riba riba means a feeling in the heart that lures you to be with that person in a haram way but if you look at a woman from the perspective that subhanallah Allah created her in a nice way Praise be Allah for his creation and nothing else apart from that. But that requires training, especially when it comes to men. Uh, Because men, the first thing they look at a good wife, ah, bed. And that's a fact. 
That's a fact. So you are better off doing what? Don't look then. Right? Don't look. If you can't control yourself and you are not in control of yourself, then and look what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, if you look at a woman and you desire her, what should you do? Now, all right, shaitan is now with you. Okay? Your lures are what? Flaming inside you. The Prophet says, if you look at a woman and you desire her, go to your wife. Go to your wife because she has more right on you than this woman. This woman doesn't belong to you. Right? Does not belong to you. So go to that woman because she's yours. She's yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nisa'ukum harthun lakum. Your women are yours. Go to them whenever you feel. And your men are yours. So go to them. And create that love atmosphere. Who among us here who are married decided one day at night when her husband is coming back to let up some nice candles for him? Switch the light a little bit down, dim it, put some of these, you know, perfumed essence, incense, and dress in something nice and wait for him. You think if, your hus- if you do this to your husband, he's going to look outside? Then he would be mad if he does. He would be mad. Huh? And this is what you should train your daughters. You, need, you don't expect your daughters to know this by themselves. They need to be trained. That if you want to keep your husband at home, be the woman he wants you to be. And if you want your wife also to be at home, be the husband she wants you to be. It's double fold. It can't be one-sided. It has to be two-sided in that in that uh, uh, regard. Then he says, unless it is for a lesson by which you may gain sagacity or benefit some knowledge, as the sight is the gate for learning. Subhanallah. When you see something, you begin, your mind begins to function as to, now I want to know more about it. I want to know more about it. When I want to know more about it, you become more knowledgeable in that regard. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Then the Imam moves to the right of the legs. Amazing, even your legs have right on. Huh? No, no, we don't think about any of these bodily parts. Huh? The Imam says, وَأَمَّا حَقُّ رِجْلَيْكَ فَأَنْ لَا تَمْشِي بِهِمَا إِلَى مَا يَحِلُّ لَكْ وَلَا تَجْعَلْهُمَا مَطِيَّتُكَ إِلَى الطَّرِيقِ الْمُسْتَخِفَّةِ بِأَهْلِهَا فَإِنَّهَا حَامِلَتُكَ وَسَالِكَتُكَ بِكَ مَسْلَكَ الدِّينِ وَالسَّبْقُ لَكْ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Wallah, the Imams when they speak, they speak only logic. And they speak amazing language. He says, the right of your la- your feet is not to use them in what you have no right to. Yani, injure someone. Right? Or be the means of hindering someone's pathway. Huh? Yani, don't stand in the middle of the road and block someone's way. You have no right. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was speaking to his companions in Medina once and he said, it is better akhlaq not to stay on public road, yani not to hang out on public road. He said, Ya Rasulullah, that's the only place we can chill. You know, in Medina they didn't have bowling alleys, they didn't have cinemas, you know. The only thing they had is that one road in front of the mosque, you know. He said, Ya Rasulullah, even there we can't sit. He said, okay, if you have to, then you must observe three rules. Allahu Akbar. And this is the right of the pathway on you. Look, even the pathway has a right on you. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what are the rights of the pathway on us? They said, number one, not to block it. You know, sometimes you see a group of youth, 10 of them standing, and a lady wants to pass, she doesn't know where to go. Even if there is a puddle of water there, they would not even move if if she has to move into or walk in the puddle of water. That's disrespect to the human dignity. Move. Let people use. Because public road means what? It's for everyone's use. It's not for you to block it. Number two. He says, وَإِمَاطَةُ الْأَذَىٰ عَنَ الطَّرِيقِ Allahu Akbar. I don't know why people want to hang out on the on public road. If they hear what the Prophet says, he said, you must remove all the debris from people's way. 
broken glass. Yeah, you become a council worker. Huh? You see a banana peel, you move it. Huh? Here, what do we do? We are all tossers. You know what a tosser? Open the window, cigarettes, bottle of milk, bottle of a drink, and you know what? We complain. Why is the Muslim world so dirty? Because we are dirty. Right? Because we can't even keep a plastic bag inside our cars to chuck things in it. Even a tissue whoosht, out of the window. You know, in the West, you chuck something out of the window, $200 fine. $200. That's why you go to Singapore. Honest to God, you can eat off the road. That's how clean this place is. Huh? You know, in Singapore, chewing gum is not allowed. You know, huh? why? To preserve this, you know, environment and this world for people to enjoy. I was, my first visit to Singapore, I came out of my hotel at lunchtime. I saw everyone is standing at lunchtime smoking. They were smoking. But guess what? Everyone had an ashtray in his hand. What a sight. I said, this is unbelievable. People are so disciplined. You're not allowed to tip your cigarette and the ashes on the floor. Everyone is tipping it like. You know, the small ashtrays they buy for about $2.50. And then they go and empty it and then again. This. I said, Allahu Akbar. I wish the Muslims would learn this. I was making tawaf. Tawaf in Kaaba. Someone in front of me. I said, Brother, you are in Kaaba and you are spitting in Masjid al Haram. Like, what manners are these? Where did you learn your manners? No wonder why I often say people who need to go to Hajj must go for two course, two weeks course. Allah al Azim, they should learn the etiquettes of what it means. I was with, with my wife in Hajj once. I was seated here, and my wife is seated next to me, and there is a person from the up, yani we were going to Arafah, and you know how the buses, uh, they are jam-packed, so the window was down, my wife was sitting next to me, and there is a guy in the other bus. I look at my wife and she's crying. I say, why are you crying? He said, this man in his ihram clothes, sitting on the other bus, he's going like this to me. I said, you are in Hajj. What discipline, what audacity Muslims have. And then we say, and you know, after we do that, we go to Kaaba. You, you, you are the devil himself. You are the devil himself. How is Allah going to answer your prayers? Huh? And then what do they tell you? They tell you in Hajj, you should not react. What should not react? Here you should react. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَمَنْ يُرِدْ بِهِ بِظُلْمٍ بِإِلْحَادٍ يعني The one who wants to create mischief and evil in Hajj, then Allah will what? Take care of him. He'll fix him up. That means what? That means you should not keep quiet when zulm is taking place in Hajj under the premise of what? Ah, don't waste your Hajj, don't waste your Hajj. They want you to always keep quiet against what is false. And this is a systematic way of how the Saudi authorities function in Hajj. You shouldn't speak about something bad. Why? So that you would not lose your Hajj. I'm not going to lose my Hajj if I stop something evil. Imam Hussein left Mecca altogether so that evil will not take place in Mecca when he heard that some people are going to kill him. Right? He left Mecca altogether. He was on the eighth day about to take, he was in his ihram clothes. The riwayah says, he changed his niyyah, took his ihram clothes and withdrew from Mecca and went to Karbala. Subhanallah. In order to what? To stand for the truth. Here the Imam says, don't allow your legs to carry you to where they're not supposed to. Huh? Because your legs and your feet are going to talk to you on the day of judgment. Why did you take us to, you know, Sind Club? Huh? Why did you take us to, I don't know, what bar? Huh? You're going to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? Don't think now if you go to Sind Club or I don't know what bar that no one can see you. Allah can see you subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see you. The right of your feet is not to use them. 
in what you have no right to nor do you make them look at this word nor do you make them your mount yani you write them your mount on the path that despises its users yani what yani your feet will begin to hate you for taking them to a haram place huh? so this goes huh? dancing floors because what happens the prophet sallallahu says yub'atu al-mar'u ala ma mata alayhi a person will be resurrected on the state he dies on so if you die bigoing you're gonna come out on the day of judgment shaking left and right right and imagine in front of all the creation of allah from adam till the time of qiyamah people all are saying ya allah save us ya allah and you are dancing huh? and you are shaking left right and center and have you ever seen someone in a car with the music on and you're standing next to him and you can't hear the music what he's doing look at him what do you see other than a monkey huh? jumping up and down in the car because you can't hear the music you look at him and says god is this guy for real is he all right you tap it hey hello are you okay ah, i'm just listening to music and then you understand this guy is freaking out huh? he's moving he's jumping he's humble and sometimes you know you're driving beside some cars and the car is pumping you know why because they have 300 subwoofers in the back you know 300 subwoofers you know what the 300 subwoofer they don't even use it in disco floors you know and the car is pumping on the road and everyone is looking at her you know show me show me the subwoofer oh man what an audio system you have in the car but this is you are going to it with your own feet and your own feet said we will testify on the day of judgment against you don't make us testify against you on the day of judgment so he then he says don't make them your mount on the path that despises its users for they are your carrier and drive you uh, they, they are your carrier and drive you on the path of religion yeah, and your feet should drive you and carry you towards the path of righteousness huh? go and visit a sick person go on a nice halal holiday Huh? You know, some jurists were asked, can I travel in Ramadan? They say, yes, absolutely, you can travel no matter what the reason, except if it is for one reason. If you travel for haram, you're not allowed to travel. You're not allowed. And if you travel and knowing that you're going to travel for haram, it is not allowed for you to break your rosa. You have to keep it. Subhanallah. The only time you have to keep your rosa when you are traveling is two times. If your work is traveling, and you are a truck driver or a pilot or a train driver or a bus driver, then you can't break your rosa. And the second time, if you're traveling for haram reason, Huh? You cannot break your rosa if you are observing rosa. Why? Because your traveling in that case become haram and you have no right to break your rosa. Subhanallah. And how many people travel? I remember in 78, I was telling some of my sisters and brothers, a Kuwaiti airline 747 was hijacked. You know, during 78, there was a lot of hijacking in the Arab world. This plane was hijacked. 70% of the passengers on the plane told their wives they're going for Umrah. Guess where the plane was hijacked? In Thailand. What a bunch of liars. Huh? Men. Huh? We're saying women, we're saying men. And the creative evil nature that they have, they think that if they lie, if they lie to their wives, Allah will not get them caught. And you know what? When Allah catch you, after He's given you so much chances, He doesn't make a scandal of you in your community. No, He makes a mockery of you in front of the whole world. Because the whole world knew about this issue. 
And you know, during that particular month when they came back, it was the highest rate of divorce in Kuwait in that month. <laughs> All the women said, you're going to Amra? Go to Amra. Go, go to Thailand. We don't want your Thailand. You are lying and taking the name of Allah in vain. Who took that person to that plane? His feet. Don't allow them to be the mount towards haram. No, train them to walk towards what is right and what is halal. I will conclude inshallah shortly. And then he says, the prize will be yours if you train them to do what is right. And there is no might except in that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Imam goes and speaks about the right of the hand. But the right of the hand is very long, subhanAllah, because there's so many things you can do with that hand. Huh? So many things. So I will stop here. I'll take some questions because I need to preserve my voice for tonight as well. I'm losing my voice. I take your leave. May Allah bless you. May Allah make us aware of the rights of our bodies on us so that they can be the excellent aid for us towards religiousness and towards closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammad. وآله الطيبين الطاهرين الله صل على محمد وآل Islam says, I'll tell you this, Islam says the only time you can speak about something that you know about another person, right? If you are personally asked about that person in regard to a proposal of a marriage. Apart from that, you cannot volunteer information. You cannot just come out and say it. Be Sorry? No, then the other person should take initiative and stop him. But if, he, if he's asking you, uh, he's not asking you, you come and voluntarily tell him, you're not allowed. I'll tell you a story. Imam Zain al Abidin, someone came and he knocked at his door. He said, Imam, your next door neighbor was speaking so bad about you. The Imam said, La hawla wa la wait. The Imam went inside, he prepared a basket of fruit. You know fruit basket? He said, give it to my neighbor. That man, he said, he's gossiping about you. He said, give it to my neighbor and then come back. So that man thought what? If the one who's speaking bad about him, he's getting a fruit basket, then I'm gonna get gold from the Imam, right? So the man came back. He said, as for you, don't show me your face at my doorstep anymore. He said, why, ya Imam, I'm doing something good to you. He said, no, what you did was extremely bad because what this man said were arrows that missed their target because I didn't hear them. What you did is you took those arrows and planted them in my heart. Because if I didn't know what he was doing or what he's saying, then I wouldn't have any problems with him, right? But because you came and told me, now I am raged, enraged with hatred. And I don't want to be in that position. If someone doesn't know that someone is talking about you, would you feel that anything towards him? No. But if he comes and tells you, even if you are the biggest mu'min, you will find something in your heart, right? At least you will be sad. Why is this man or woman is speaking about me? So don't be in a position where you transform or transport news. Huh? Because the companions of the Prophet said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is ghiba? He said to mention something about your brother that he doesn't like you to mention in public. He said, then they said, then what is bohtan? 
Bohtan is a worse level than Riba. He said to mention, ah, in the first case, he has that habit, but he doesn't like anyone to know about it in public, right? But you go and speak about him, it's Riba. He said, Bohtan is to fabricate something about him which he doesn't have. Huh? To say something for him, he's greedy, but he's not. But you hate him, so you fabricate something about him in that regard. This is a worse form than riba itself. You know, it's slander. It's called slandering the dignity. And then the Prophet had taught us, when your brother Muslim or sister Muslim does something that you become aware of, which is haram, you must make sure you hide it from the eyes of the people. Man satara aiban aiba akhi whoever covers and conceals the shortcomings and the mistake of his brother or sister, Allah will hide his shortcomings on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. So you imagine if you know something about someone, let's say for example, it came to my awareness that this particular person drinks alcohol, but no one else does it. He's secretly. I have no right to tell people about it. Huh? Because maybe repent. There was a scholar who went to a man's house to visit him, knowingly that he drinks alcohol. But he wanted to teach his students a practical lesson of how to preach da'wah in a nice way. So he went to his wife. The minute he went in, he saw a bottle next to the couch. You know what the Mawlana did? He took his abaya and he covered the bottle with it. His students noticed that. They saw what he did. So, when he spoke to the man, not once he mentioned to him, why do you drink alcohol? Not once. He just said, we miss you. you haven't, we haven't seen you in a long time. MashaAllah, your father was this and that, and you're a good man. I hope one day we will see you in the mosque. Salaamu Alaikum, he left. That night, that man came to the mosque. He said, you know, Mawlana, every Mawlana before you that came to the mosque, he used to tell everyone, don't go to that man's house because he drinks alcohol. You are the first Mawlana that came and hid the bottle with your blessed abaya so that you will not make a mockery of me. I make Allah bear witness that from this moment, I'm repenting to Allah. Huh? Because of the approach and the method. Hide the secrets of your brothers and approach them in a healthy way. They will change their ways. But you make a mockery of them. That person here will say, I'm sinning and I'm sinning. I might as well enjoy it then. Everyone knows I'm bad now. So I might as well. God is not going to accept me and the community is not going to accept me. So let me chill the way I want to chill. Right? Then you have closed the doors of tawbah and repentance for your brothers in that regard. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't understand the, the, the question correctly. Okay. 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 If if she is unable to do that deed because she is exempted for medical reason and she has knowledge about the religion, right? She has a right to advise the person, but not to dictate to that person. Yeah, she has the right to advise in a nice way if she knows the law about this particular act. But if she's just wanting to make a comment or chuck a comment, then it's better that you remain silent. Not you, of course, wherever the person is. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, uh, yes. Yes. No, she should demand. That's her right. She tells him, she should tell him that if you want me to be beautiful, you, I want you to be, I love you, I want to see you beautiful. Right? It's my right. I want to feast my eyes on your beauty. Right? What's up until when? Huh? 
until when I'm going to do something? Huh? What happens if I go and I get an ugly one later on? Huh? <laughs> no, it's good to do sabr, sister. But in doing sabr, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. But do it in a nice way. Yani, let us, if the, our husband stops to be husbands, let us not stop to be wives. Right? And if our wives stop to be wives, men should not stop to be husbands. Right? Yes, sister. Uh, Ayatollah Sistani and all of the Ayatollahs, majority of them, they say that if you take makeup as a sign to attract people, and it is so obvious, right, that people will be attracted to you, it's haram, outright haram. Some maraja now they say, if the community you live in, they ascribe to a very modest, modest form of, let's say, for example, foundation, blush, uh, very very subtle uh, 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 lip colors okay but it's not very obvious right then it is allowed otherwise it's haram in the community even if it is subtle and the community you live does not ascribe to that form of makeup it also becomes haram that's what i said both if you are in a community that does not allow you that it becomes a sign of attraction even if it was subtle you cannot wear it according to ayatollah sistani whether it's heavy or whether it's subtle yes like for example if you go to the west many women in the west they put they apply very light makeup okay some maraja say if you do it where it does not become so obvious right then it is not a problem the other question you tell me common sense what makes a non-muslim less of a human being what makes him less of a human being huh? does it make him less of a human being? And, and let me tell you something, sister. If you train yourself, look what the imam says, train yourself not to be obscene. Okay, if you train yourself to make riba on non-Muslim, wouldn't that lead you to make riba about Muslims? So leave both of them. It does not make sense, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I say. Islam is common sense. Islam is natural. If your natural instinct says it does not make sense, then it is not Islam. Right? Yes. Yes, sister. Okay. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Okay, I think that personal space that teenagers often ask for has to be earned, right? If you want that space, take that space, no problem. And parents should accommodate that space. But are you worthy of that space? Are you wise enough to take that space? Mom, trust me, I know what I'm doing. You sleep. Okay, I forgive you. Mom, why don't you trust me? You sleep again. Okay, then you are not. I'm not saying you, huh? please. I'm saying in a general sense. Okay, then that child, how could that teenager be trusted by his parents when he's already abused that trust once and twice and three times and four? You want your space? Take your space. But act in a dignified manner. Act in a manner that when your mother who's not around, Huh? And you're not responsible for your mother, by the way, or your dad. You're responsible to yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you go out and your mother is not with you or your dad with you, don't think that, ah, now I'm independent, I can do anything I want because no one can watch over my back. No, Allah is watching over your back. You're not responsible to your mom or dad, okay? When you go outside and you behave in an immaculate way and someone comes home and says, you know what? You know, auntie, your daughter is amazing in public. Finish, you earned your trust. 
right? But when someone comes and says, Auntie, you know, we saw your daughter today. Oh my God, I don't know where to start from, right? You've already abused that space that you are talking about. And that's why I say to my teenagers, you want space, your parents will give you all the space you want, but act accordingly, you know, and earn that space in a dignified matter, and the sky is the limit, right? This is a double fault question and it requires a double fault answer. Number one, I think the interpretation of the laws of Islam has for so long been predominantly male motivated. Okay? So they are not interpreted from the perspective of what females feel. So it's always been male dominated. All right? So when it is male dominated, surely there will be a sense of bias in it. Right? Because women contribution to the interpretation of the laws of Islam, unfortunately, has been limited. That's number one. Number two, it is unfortunate that the women themselves don't know their rights so that they could ask for it. For example, do you know, Islamically speaking, and this is probably the biggest bombshell I'm going to drop in Pakistan. Okay, this is the atomic bomb. Right? That women can demand prenup conditions before they sign the marriage contract. Huh? Do you know that a woman can stipulate you cannot marry temporary marriage? You cannot marry full-time marriage. I want you to share the household chores with me. This is part of the marriage contract. You know, if I speak this from the member in one of your imam bargains, my turban will be taken out. Huh? I will be pulled down from the member. All right? Why? Because the community has not practiced such rights. Okay, tell me something. When a woman marries, what's the first thing she wants to do? No, no, no. Before, before that, straight away she changes her name to her husband's name, right? And that is anti-Islamic. Do you know that? Islam says, Call them married or not married by their parents' name. So you should, yani, I am Sheikh Jihad Ismail Chandu, for example, or Ali Bai. Okay, my daughter is Ali Bai or Ismail. She marries someone from the family of Raza or Taki or whatever. Her name has to stay Sarah Ismail. She's now married into the Taki family, hyphen Taki. You know, hyphen Taki. But don't lose your identity. This is God given right to you. And then you know what? We say Islam does not give right to the woman. This is a Western practice. You know what women in the, in the Western world are doing now? No woman in the West now allows herself to take her husband name. And she puts it as a prenup that if you want me to take your name, I will hyphenate the name. Yani I will keep my surname and then I will put a hyphen and take your name so people will know I'm married now into that family. But don't erase the identity of that woman simply because she married into that family. Right? And subhanallah, subhanallah, how just Allah is to show the status of woman. He gave the progeny of Muhammad from a woman, not from a man. Huh? From Fatima, not from a boy. That everyone wants a boy huh? as the first child. Yet the Prophet says, My progeny is in Fatima, salamullah, not in my boys. And still, we suppress the right of women. I say to our women, Go and read about your rights. 
and let men honor you on the basis of what Allah honored you with. Secondly, when you want to claim your rights, don't claim them from men because they are not the standard of right giving. Claim your rights from Allah because He is the standard of right giving. You are not competing against man to get your right because Allah has given you your right already. So why are you asking a man like you to give you your right when Allah has already given you your right? Right? Why? Why do you want to demand it from a man? He does not own it. It is Allah who owns that right. And you can only do that by educating your children, your girls. But if I go now home and every other mother goes home and we will fall back to our traditional way of dealing with our kids, then why ask for change? Huh? You think one man can change the world? No, it takes a whole society to challenge the status quo and change the situation at hand. Teach your, let, let there be one in the community that becomes the sacrifice of the community. Right? Let one person say, okay, it's not my daughter. Let's see a parent who's a male says, if I want to marry my son, I want to demand that the girl takes prenup against him. Right? Let's see, then the situation will be fixed. Right? Because if a girl will start it, she will do what? She will be the talk of town. She's a rebel. She's a tomboy. Right? She becomes the tomboy of the community. But there has to be sacrifice at some stage. Has to be. If you read Tafsir al Ayashi, Tafsir al Ayashi, that she volunteered. She said, I'll cook, I'll mind the kids, and I will sweep the floor. Anything outside the door, I've got nothing to do with it. You do everything outside the door, right? But guess what happened? Even when Imam Ali came inside the door, he also still helped say the Zahra in household work. There is a riwaya when the Imam, when the Prophet came and he saw his daughter grinding wheat and holding Imam Hassan in her hand. You know what he said to Imam Ali? What did he say? He said, Ah, oh, mashallah, my daughter is a good daughter. She's a good wife to you. Okay, let's chill and have shisha. Did Rasulullah say that? He said to Imam Ali, pick one of the tasks. Either mind the children or grind the wheat so that can, we can give her some break. So Imam Ali said, I'll grind the wheat. Rasulullah said, then I will play with Hassan. Let Fatima have some rest. Huh? If we can train our kids to have that sort of a life, then when they grow to be husbands and wife, then it becomes a non-issue. Then the husband, before even his wife have to tell him this, he will get up, he will wash the dishes, he will be at the sink, he will wash the, his clothes, he will iron his clothes. What's the big deal? Does it take his manhood away if he picked his plate up and went to the sink and washed it? You know, it's unfortunately we have families that, you know, the whole family gets up. Who has to clean? That poor daughter-in-law. You know, she has to pick up the whole table. She has to clean. Yes, she will get the reward. But don't take a ride on her back. She's a human being as well and she has rights, right? Because if that was your daughter, you would not allow it and you will be cursing your son-in-law day and night. Right? Right? So why allow it to other people's children or daughters in that regard? Because they are cultural based, they are not Islamically based. They are, sorry, can I be a step further? They are Hindu based. Huh? All the practices you have at home, they are covered by a screen called Islam. But the core principle, uh, 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 um, standard of living in a traditional sub, uh, uh, Indian subcontinent home is Hindu based. Huh? Which is unfortunate, which is very unfortunate. Islam does not say that. Islam says, no, you have equal right as the husband is. So why allow yourself to be dictated by Hindu-based culture rather than the Islamic-based culture? But that's not an excuse, sister. Okay, I affiliate with you sometimes that some Maulanas do also abuse 
the rights of women. I'm not saying no. However, however, there are so many Maulanas who spoke so eloquently about the rights of women. You know, and the biggest Maulana that spoke about the rights of women is Rasulullah. Who more do you want than Rasulullah to grant you your rights? Right? So we must claim our rights, but not from men from Allah. This is God given right to you. It's double fault. It's the society, the people themselves for not speaking out and partly the ulama for not educating the women about their rights. So it's double fault. It's not one fault. Yes, sister. Hmm. Sorry, what was the beginning of the question? We think we shouldn't stay quiet. No, you shouldn't stay quiet. Yeah, yes, definitely. You should not stay quiet. Not should stay quiet. I think you should voice your opinion when women's rights are being abused. And I'll have this question to just give up. Yes, absolutely. You have every right. I mean, what, for example, are you married? Okay. What are you going to do when you get married? I'm not praying in your personal life. But a husband comes to ask for your hand. Are you going to take a prenup? No. Then how is the community going to change? After I've already lost my voice, right? Talking about, I'm not taking it out on you, sister. Please don't feel offended. But after I've lost my voice, after I've been talking about women rights for the past 10 nights, and when I asked the first girl, what are you going to do when you get married? I'll do it the traditional way. La ilaha illallah. <laughs> right? Oh, sorry, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that. No, no, no. I, I, I'm just picking on you. That's all. Honest to God. I, I felt picking on you. That's all. I'm saying is that someone has to take the initiative to say no is no and enough is enough abuse of women's rights. Right? And t trust me, I've got nothing to lose. Right? Um, with all due respect to this community, I'm not from this community, right? Although all of them are my brothers and sisters. But when it comes to speaking the truth and what I feel Islam told me to say, I will say it no matter what happens. Right? However, challenging a community which has been used to so much abuse, you cannot just come and all of a sudden change the community. You have to have some gradual change so that the community also does not lose trust in you. Right? So slowly, maybe what you can start doing is educate the women themselves about their rights. Conduct halakas, right? I'm sure there are so many educated and learned women here that know about Islam and the right of Islam. Or the internet is an amazing, amazing machine these days which puts knowledge at our fingertips, right? Go and research women rights. Go and read a book called Rights of Women by Allama Mutahari. Right? Oh, it's called, sorry, The Status of Muslim Women or The Rights of Muslim Women by Shaheed Mutahari. It is an amazing book when it speaks about the rights of women in Islam. If anyone comes to challenge you, quote the book. This guy is an ayatollah, he's a mushtahid, right? And that way you empower yourself. You know why men do not wish you to know your rights? Because they don't want to empower you. And Islam came to empower women. You know, I know when men listen to me, they think, is this guy a man? Yeah, trust me, I am a man. Uh, and I will speak forever. You know what happens? I don't like to boast about myself. Wallah, it's not my... But sometimes you have to mention these things. I gave a similar lecture in Friday namaz in my mosque once. After I finished my khutbah, a group of women came to me. They said, Sheikh, can we borrow your wife for five minutes? I said, take... They went 5, 10, 15. I said, I want my wife now. I love my wife. Bring her back to me. So when they came back, they said, you know what? You are someone that practices what he preaches. Because we ask your woman what you do at home. And they told us something that was amazing. 
All right? Do you know for a fact, just letting you know, and I even told Trizabai, I said, next time I come here, I have one condition. You put an iron board and an iron in my room because I don't allow anyone to touch my clothes. I have to iron them myself. And you know, sometimes when I'm eyeing my clothes, my wife says, can you iron this hijab for me? I said, yeah, bring it, no problem. <laughs> no problem. But we have to take the initiative, right? We have to do something at home ourselves and not speak from it from the member because it's not going to come from the heart. People will know that you are a fake person when you speak about women's rights and you don't do it at home. So we need to take the initiative ourselves in order to change the status quo. Yes. Yes. Because, and for, you know what? In that case, what a woman should do is leave the man for two days at home to do the home chores and just go out. And then they will appreciate how difficult it is. One day there is a story, a man came home and the wife has not done the homework. Nothing, she did not touch anything. So uh, the husband asked, what happened today? The wife said, nothing, nothing. He said, what do you mean? She said, nothing. He said, she, he said, she said what do you mean what happened today? She said, the house is in a mess. She said, that's why I said nothing. Because when you come every day and you say everything immaculate, you never say, what happened to the house today? Right? Because you don't appreciate the work that goes into it. Right? It's hard work. It's hard labor. No, ma no wonder why Allah said in the Quran, the wife has a right to demand what a wage when she suckles a baby. Do you know that? For six, eight months, when you suckle a baby, your husband has to pay you wages. Huh? Why? Because this is take. Sorry? She's not double the chore, sister. She's not doing double the chores. She's doing quadruple the chores. She's doing her home. Her home. Her in law's home. Her parents' home. Right? Or sometimes her children's home. Huh? And you know what? It is unfortunate that when we marry a woman, we don't marry her to be equal with her. But we marry her because she's a washing machine, she's a dishwasher, she's an oven, and she's a vacuum cleaner. Absolutely, without a doubt. And if she doesn't know how to do these four things, ah, oh, what a bad wife she is. Doesn't matter. Yes. Yes, yes. No, you should, because that's what you need to promote in the community. By Allah, I would not have spoken about my personal life if I didn't feel the need to promote it. But we have to promote it, and we can't promote it unless we do it ourselves, right? But that's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Then you know the men, what should they have? Men should have a woman, a, a, a men, men, men club for advocacy of women rights. Huh? So will me and your husband will form a club shall, for women rights, inshallah. Yes, sister. Yes. You are allowed to sketch anything unless it is not involving someone who is not decently dressed. So if someone is indecently dressed, firstly you're not allowed to look at them. Right? So you're not. But anything else you're allowed. <coughs> yeah, you can sculpt. There is no problem. No problem. No problem. There is no problem in sculpting a human body. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No problem. Yeah. In 
encouraged. Yes, because you see, my daughters, two daughters are married to the same family. Yes. And we didn't know about this, you see, but their father and mother and they themselves told us. Subhanallah. Excellent. I mean, that's then that's a, that's a practical family that they did not abuse the fact that they knew about it and kept it to themselves. They were so honourable to come and say, "No, you know what? Take a prenup just for in honour of your daughters." So that's amazing. What are the conditions of prenup? I have 17 conditions. You want them? I have 17 conditions. Sister. In Sydney, we don't do marriages. 60 to 80 percent of our marriages are prenup marriages. So we have a standard prenup chart. The, the husband and wife, before they get married, they come and sit with us for about an hour. We go to the prenup, we decide on what points they are, sign it, seal, delivered, then they get married. Yes. You need, you need, sister. You know what you need here? You need marriage workshops. Not marriage lectures, marriage workshops. So people come involved and you involve a number of speakers about this. No? The reason why we did it is just for authority sake. But if you don't want to involve a Maulana, you don't have to involve a Maulana. We don't have to be everywhere. Yeah. Yes. No, I'll tell you why. Hold it, hold it, hold it. We say that a man has to spend on the wife even if she earns and earns inheritance from her parents. Even if he's poor and she's rich, she's under no obligation to spend on him. Number one. A woman is not under any obligation to spend on her parents, but he is. Okay? The man pays the dowry and the woman does not pay the dowry. Right? I don't know about here. Who pays the dowry here? Oh, the man, right? So the man has to be. So here, three expenses the man has to do when the woman has to spend nothing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and he divides the inheritance, because of her expenses are limited, he gives her because it will be what? It will be substantiated from other expenses. And that's why at the end of the day, you will find that the expenses of inheritance and the share of inheritance and the expenses involved in as far as men and women are concerned will be more in favor of women than men. If you do a calculation of how, and that's why I say women should not demand anything less than what secures their future when it comes to their mahar. That's their haq. And they should ask for it in advance. That's another right, by the way, for a wife, is that she can ask for her mahar and haq in advance and in full. Right? Yes. I really have to leave. Uh, thank you so much for your attentiveness. I hope to see you tonight. Inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum. But before we leave, can we please all read Surah Mubarak Al Fatiha with the Niyyah of Shifa for our sister Zahra? I feel it that way. Sallallahu alayhi wa